So oh, Ian, finally, I get to meet you. Finally, yeah, I've been avoiding you all these years. I know <laughs> we've been communicating in the world of Twitter. Yeah. Um, we'll get on to things of the future soon, um, but it's a great opportunity to meet you. Um, oh, pleasure, great to meet you too. I think uh, you've all been part of a lot of our kind of childhoods um, in, in, in various forms of factors. Um, I'm sure you're going to come on to this a creator, an inspiration entrepreneur. I think we would describe you as. You can nod. <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, you know, we're going we're to kind of do a bit of the, this is your life, um, uh, a shorter version. Is right. sure. that because of life, my life's been so long so far? I oh, know, because you have so much experience. Yeah, um, 47 years in the games industry, for sure. 47 years. Um, but before we get into the uh, beginnings part, um, I know you've got two exciting new titles. Uh, coming out, Dice Men um, is, is the uh, book about your time, obviously, playing workshop, um, and also Shadow of the Giants. Tell me a little bit about those two um, and why people should be interested in them. Well, Shadow of the Giants is uh, a Final Fantasy game book um, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the publication of the Warlock of Firetop Mountain in 1982. That's when the first interactive game book that Steve Jackson and I wrote came out. And um, it's the latest in the series, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. And, but Dice Men is the origin story of, of Games Workshop. Uh, it's coming out on November the 10th. And it's, I'm talking about basically the, the first 10 years of Games Workshop, how Steve yeah. Jackson and I started our company way back in 1975 really on the back of securing the distribution rights for Dungeons and & Dragons and then publishing White Dwarf magazine, setting up Citadel Miniatures, the Games Workshop retail chain, and uh, ultimately Warhammer. And um, there were lots of bumps along the way. We had to live in a van for some three months. And never had any cash for the business. So you go to the bank manager and say, we've got this great game. It's a role-playing game which would kill monsters and find treasure. It's called Dungeons and & Dragons. And the bank manager looked at you rather like a dog watching television. Had no understanding whatsoever what we were talking about. And, uh, so we had to build the business really out of cash flow. Um, but even though it was tough at the time, we were making it up as we went along it was very exciting because we were turning our hobby of playing games into a business of, of publishing games and what else could be better than that so is it a story that you've told to the level you have before or is this kind of the first time you've opened up the whole the whole piece of the story this is the first time kind of warts and all all the kind of yeah. bad times as well as the good times and how the com company might have gone under several moments in time and how we survived and um, yeah, look at Games Workshop today. You know, we've, we haven't been involved with the company since 1991, but it's now a publicly traded company, valued around about £3 billion on the London Stock Exchange. And so you kind of watch on as proud parents yeah, as like your a, child your does child, yeah. amazingly well uh, without you. <laughs> Is there some kind of regret that you're not somewhat involved in it, even if it's a, you know, more of a board member or something like that? I think you should never look back. I mean, I've had a, such an amazing career in games that I have no regrets. Yes. From Games Workshop to Finding Fancy to being executive chairman of, of, of IDOS and launching Tomb Raider and, and then as an angel investor in, in some very successful mobile games companies uh, as being chairman of Sumo and ultimately... Um, negotiating the sale of, of that company to Tencent and, and now as a general partner in Hero Capital which is funding new games companies moving from being an entrepreneur to an investor in games you know it's nice now to have my finger in everybody else's pie and hopefully add a bit of value along the way so um, obviously we'll put the link on pointing in the description guys so just look down below for Dice Man. and now when is that one out it's not out just yet is it Dice Man has been published by Unbound um, which is a, it's a crowdfunding publisher on, on November the 10th but it will be into retail as well but people can still pledge today great. to, to get the game so they can pre-order it now yeah um, and it's a great Christmas present as well isn't it yes marvellous Christmas <laughs> presents <laughs> and, and, and fine, you know just uh, looking at just pull it up here because we're uh, very much of the uh, reportage style way we do interviews <laughs> Ian's just signed this book for me one of my own book uh, in fact and, and amazingly um, I believe this is the 71st 
uh, fight, uh, fighting fantasy yeah, book, the new yeah, book. The new one. Well, yeah. Free Will Fighter was published originally in, in the 80s. But so the new one. Uh, the Shadow new one, Shadow of the Giants, is uh, the 71st book. Steve Jackson and I have both written new ones to celebrate the 40th anniversary. Steve's is called Secrets of Salamonis. Mine is Shadow of the Giants. And people would expect us to be going back to Firetop Mountain. So you do at the beginning of my book go to Firetop Mountain, where the legend of you know, the Zagor first happened all those years ago. But um, what happens is you find a, an artifact which results in these giants being released and um, they grow to this enormous height and they're iron giants and they are intent on flattening the world and it's up, you, you're up to you, the reader, to find out how they can be destroyed and who might give you the, the, um, the, the knowledge and the, the items to, to make that happen. So it's a, a race against time to save a land from these horrendous, gargantuous, metallic beasts. How, how I can see it in your eyes, how, how after so many years do you um, find it like that sort of buzz for creating these characters and these stories? Because you're still involved in it. Some people just put their feet up and kind of say they're done. Right now, you know? Well, I'm never going to retire. I'm 72 years old now. And and I'm still very excited every day to be involved in the game industry. I love creating content. You know, when I handed Secrets of Giants into the publisher, Scholastic, you kind of think, well, that's that. I'm done now. I'm finished. But about a day later, you have an idea. and think, oh, that would make a great idea. And you suddenly want to start all over again. It's like climbing mountain. You just want a new mountain to climb. Do you write things down? Like when you yeah. I did some this morning. I went to see the Lord of the Rings premiere last night. And, uh, you know, I've got a couple of ideas in that to yeah. maybe put into a fighting fantasy format. So right at the beginning, I'm going to go, you know, dare I go back, you know, we're all of a certain age, don't worry, and I'm creeping 50, but when you were a, a child, was there any, you know, child and teenage years, anything that, um, you know, stuck in your mind that inspired you from a games point of view back then? Well, I learned chess at an early age um, and uh, became a big Monopoly player at school. I used to play all, all the time and challenge everybody and, and got a bit sort of smug about it that um, just to wind up the play people up against if they landed if I happened to have the cheap properties like Old Ken Road and Mine Chapel, well, I wouldn't bother collecting the rents and call it chicken feed, I don't need that to be able to win. And now I used to wind people up. And uh, so much they they changed my nickname from chicken feed to feed whilst at school. And then but that's where I met Steve Jackson and John Peake, the third member of, of Games Workshop. And after university, um, I didn't go to university, but Steve and John did. I went to uh, college where I did HND in business studies, which was very useful in, the, in, in, in helping me build Games Workshop as a business. And um, we met up again in London, still had a hobby of playing games. Um, had pretty boring jobs that were never going to get us particularly excited. And so he used to play board games in the evening and always talks about how can we turn this hobby into some sort of um, enterprise. And so we decided to publish a newsletter called Owl and Weasel and we sent it out to everybody we knew in games and one of those people was Gary Gygax, although we hadn't sent it to him in Dungeons Dragons. Yeah. We hadn't sent it to him directly. Right. And he wrote back to us and said, love your magazine, here's this new game I've just designed, what do you think? And it was a... Uh, it's a white box with a very ordinary illustration on the front, but when you opened up that box, it opened up your imagination like no game had ever done before. I don't think any game ever will again. And we figured it out finally. Like this role-playing game, we're taking on the roles of heroes, wizards, and clerics, killing monsters and finding treasure, navigating a dungeon created by a dungeon master, one of the players. And we became obsessed with it. So we ordered six copies, and on the back of that order, Gygax gave us a three-year exclusive distribution agreement for the whole of Europe. Wow. Because he was also operating get it out. in yeah. a flat in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And that's how we started off, by selling D&D &D through, through mail order, and ultimately... We got an office, we went to the States to meet Gygax, sign up fledgling companies and um, opened our very first retail shop in 1978.
a perfect interlude for uh, part one to end and part two to start, so that will be the next video.